Hello and welcome back. My name is Latasha Hewitt and I'm here with the leadership and health gang, team, crew, all of that good stuff. And this week we're talking about stress and uh, we let's introduce our panelists today. We have Jamie Pottinger. Give us a wave, Jamie. All right. We have Dr. Yvette Weir. Give us a wave. We have Dr. Chinasa and Dr. Lynette Moore. Thank you all for joining us. And as I said before, today we're talking about stress. And I know that that's something that is very much familiar to many of us. Um, but we want to dig into it a little deeper and kind of figure out what it is, how we can manage it, and eventually overcome it. So let's let's jump right into our first question. What is stress? I mean, we all say, oh, I'm so stressed. Um, but uh, technically, what does it mean? Let, let's hear from the panel. What is stress? Stress is the body's natural response uh, to demands. The, the demands could be physical, mental, social, financial. Um, and it's usually felt as a urgency or tension. And um, it could be considered good stress and there are some bad stress. And, um, and we can, we'll get into more um, details about those types of stressors. Okay, good stress, that's a good point. There could be a good stress. All right, Dr. Weir, you were saying something? Sure. I'd like to say that stress is anything that takes us out of our comfort zone, whether that is short term or long term. That's my working definition of stress. Okay, great. I think that pretty much sums it up. And I think we can all pretty much relate to that feeling and that emotion. So when we talk about stress, um, obviously anything that is on our mind affects our body as well. How does stress really affect us physically? Even though we're emotionally tied up with what's happening, what does it do to our bodies? Uh, stress could affect us both physically and psychologically. Like Dr. West said, Dr. Lynette said, um, it could be either good stress or bad stress. And Dr. Dr. Yvette, what she meant about the short, either short term or long term could be acute or chronic. So acute could be good and our body reacts to it and we just reverse back. But when it's chronic, it, it has a lot of adverse effects on different systems in the body. And once different systems are adversely affected continuously over a period of time, it, it, um, at, at the end of the day, it affects us physically. For example, chronic stress, chronic stress can increase the level of stress hormone in your body, which is the cortisol. Cortisol has effects. It's an inflammatory hormone. It has effects on your blood sugar, it has effects on your sleep pattern. So this eventually will have a physical effect. You'll be always looking tired. You'll be worn out. And there's a lot more that not just physical, even psychological and what else goes on inside the body too. I, I would so, like to add to, I would like to add to that, um, Natasha, by saying that um, the adverse impact that stress has on your body, it, it, it not only cripples you, but it cripples everyone who you engage with. Because when you're not being able to perform at your highest level, then that impacts everybody as who you should be supporting or others who are connected to you via team. And if you're the weak link in that, in, in that team or that group or that organization, then the level of results or productivity will be totally, totally affected in a negative sense if you're going through that level of negative stress. And um, some folks use that as a motivating factor to address other areas in their life. So I think that it depends on the perspective where stress is concerned. But once it's bad stress, it means nothing good for us or our teams. Absolutely. And I just want to take a minute. If you know someone who's stressed right now, please share this broadcast with them because we are going to be sharing some strategies to manage the stress. So make sure you share this. Anyone else want to comment about the effects of stress on our bodies or and, and everything else that we, we yes. experience. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd like to share some additional um, information. Looking from head to toe, um, some persons may develop headaches. It could be migraine headaches or tension headaches. Um, they may also develop some tension across their shoulders, um, tight muscles. Um, it's, they may have some grinding, and I'm sure um, um, Dr. Uh, we will talk about that um, some more. Uh, teeth grinding while they're sleeping. Uh, some persons get just frequent infections, um, elevated blood pressure, a lump in the throat sensation, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, and those are just few 
of some of the uh, symptoms persons may experience due to stress. Um, but I should also um, caution that persons that are experiencing these things on a, are, on a regular basis should certainly uh, seek medical um, evaluation to make sure there's no underlying medical condition causing these symptoms. And that's a good point. I know a lot of people, and I'm sure you guys hear this all the time, who come to the doctor, go to the doctor and say they're not feeling well. And after some evaluation, the doctor pretty much tells them you need to eliminate stress out of your life. And they're like, what? I didn't even realize I was stressed. But they're they're assuming something physically is wrong, but there is based on what's happening up there in, in their mind. So um, when we think about stress, of course, it's not something, the bad stress is what we want to get rid of. What are some strategies people can use to manage their stress level? Um, we know stressors are going to come, but how can we combat them when they arise? Well, I'd like to start first by acknowledging it. And um, I see that in the office when patients come in and, you know, we, we usually take their blood pressure and their bl blood pressure is elevated, whether they are aware of it or they're not. Um, it does begin a, a conversation. And what a lot of times they might have white coat syndrome when there's anxiety because they're coming to see me, but it allows me to strike a conversation with them on why their pressure might be high if, if they don't expect it to be. And very oftentimes I come in with, you know, are you experiencing any stress? And I begin there. Um, I'm not stepping into the MDs um, arena. I'll send them over, but some of the, natural ways that I encourage them to manage stress is kind of like where I am right now, where I encourage them to get outside, get outside into the fresh air, get sunlight, um, go for exercise, take walks, and, um, you know, allow my, my other coaches to add to that. But exercise is, is a huge, huge part of what I would say in managing stress. Dr. Weir, before we hear from everyone else, I just want to remind everyone that you you are in dentistry, and uh, Dr. Moore referred to the grinding of the teeth. Um, what what other ways can it manifest, um, you know, in terms of our dental hygiene? Well, when you have stress, which may or may not be related to anxiety and depression, just diving a little bit deeper into mental health challenges and issues, it can manifest itself in behavior that is not um, health promoting. And so, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll find, I'll see patients who just say, I, I stopped brushing teeth, just giving up, stop. Wow. Um, which of course is gonna lead to caries um, eventually. Um, sometimes their way of dealing with stress is through smoking, um, which really, um, adds to periodontal disease. Um, and, you know, sometimes they're not controlling their diabetes and, and there's a correlation between blood sugar management as well as period disease. So, and, and that very same grinding, which puts in an extreme amount of tension and pressure on, the, on, our, on, our, on our teeth can lead to fractures in our teeth. Wow. If the, if the fracture occurs in just the right or wrong way that is a, a tooth that's going to need to be extracted you know if it's a vertical fracture um and they come in it's going to need to be extracted if not you know they there's also um pro inflammatory cytokines that develop that also work to break down your gums you know break down the the structures that support the teeth so there's a lot with stress that comes right into our oral health and our oral cavity, um, not just systemic only. Mm. That, that's, that's important because, you know, even having to go through all that creates more stress. So the stress caused this, which causes more stress because now you have to address it. And I know you mentioned earlier about being outside as a stress reliever. What are some other strategies, um, team, that we can do to just not let stress overcome us and, and take over our bodies? Go ahead, Dr. I Mike. think that... Um, as um as leaders that we should develop the ability to say no um in appropriate circumstances sometimes we may take on too many tasks um in a short period of time and that may be overwhelming 
course, leading to the increased uh, stress um, and pressure. And so the ability to say no, I think, would be very important uh, to help decrease our stressors. Important. That's that's a good. That's key. Now you mentioned leaders. Uh, not to deviate too far, but do do leaders have a sense of responsibility in helping um, their employees or those under them um, manage on the job stress? Should we be as leaders looking out for the individuals who are under us, seeing that they may be stressed out, and then addressing that? What do you guys think? I I think that it's it's a part of a leader's responsibility for the health of those who they work with or who they supervise. I think it can be challenging sometimes, but I think the challenge comes sometimes, and I'm gonna look at stress from this perspective, whereby we have people doing things or performing certain tasks that is not along their greatest areas of strength. So that immediately creates a, a, a tense environment for them to work, and then that impacts the way they feel. And, and you'll hear some folks like, Mondays are the worst days ever, because just thinking about the tasks that I'll be performing at work is something that brings on that kind of pressure on me and it, it, it negatively impacts my level of performance. Now what that does is that it creates tension over the entire team because that person now is just going to work to pay the bills but they're not fully invested because emotionally they're not stable and they're not enjoying the task that they're doing. That impacts negatively the levels of productivity that is secured in that work environment. So as leaders, it's very important for us when we're thinking about placing our staff or placing our team or assigning certain tasks, that we ensure that people are really in their right fit. Because by having them in their right fit, even if they're having external stress factors, the work environment may be that one place that they really experience some sense of peace or joy. They're looking forward to it. And when that happens, now you have your workers, they're satisfied with their position and they're doing more because they're doing something that they enjoy. So the level of fulfillment is greater and the level of productivity is enhanced. And now as a leader, you find yourself with less stress trying to manage that person because that person feels as if they're in their right fit. It's funny you should say that because I'm thinking about, well, right now we're in the middle of a pandemic, as we all know, and we're not in our traditional workplaces, most of us or some of us. And so people are having to manage not just the stress of getting work done, but also the stress of home the stress of what's happening in the world. So this is a heightened level of stress right now for everyone. And so I think it's really important to explore some more of these these ways that we can, because usually, you know, even the drive to work was a time to be able to let off some steam. And when we're not getting that, you know, what are some ways we can manage stress during a pandemic? Because, you know, we're not able to do as many things as, as we would like. Of course, being outside, as Dr. Weir said, is very important, but any other strategies? I think, um, first of all, we have to be able to identify what exactly um, provokes the stress for us. Different people have different stress. So some people are not stressed out with work. Some people are stressed out with having to be at home, the children, different stressors. So identify, first of all, what your stressor is. Then you'll be able to manage it. One thing I tell people is time management is key. You have to be able to plan. Right now, in, in there's we can't really do a lot of very elaborate planning now because it's that these are uncertain times. However, you can be able to still plan or schedule your days or schedule your week at least so that each time is accountable for. Once you're able to control your time, you'll be able to give your maximum best at each at each um, activity you have to do work or manage uh, homeschooling or manage um other like co-workers, whatever it is you need to do, there should be a time frame for everything. And that way you'll be able to limit the time of this so much work on yourself. But identifying whatever causes you stress is, first of all, the first way to be able to control that effect of the stress on your body. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Ives said earlier about exercising. Exercising is a great way to let off that steam because you, you secrete all the feel good and the things and you know, you're just in your own space. And you, I just, I tell people always do something that you enjoy, always exercise, do exercises that you enjoy, not exercises you just brought down from YouTube. Just, you have to enjoy it. If you're not enjoying it, then you're just punishing yourself and you're adding more stress to yourself. So because exercise can actually be a, a stressor, 
if it's not enjoyable. So it's important that uh, you, while you're using exercise as a distressing technique, you have to enjoy it. I agree with that. And the thing I realized too about stress is sometimes you don't realize you're stressed until you exercise and you start to feel your muscles like loosening. Like, wow, I really built up a lot of a lot of stress there. So that's why it's important. Dr. Ware, you're gonna say something? Yeah, I think Dr. Chinasa wants to get us all dancing. You watch her. <laughs> watch her. We love that. <laughs> yeah, she wants us all up and dancing, right? That's always I, that's I think fun. I think um, this is a great time to be creative and um, to explore new hobbies, new passion. Today I did um, tuna salad with chickpeas. And uh, I, of course I'm plant-based already anyway, and I've been that way all my life, but it's good to be examining more the science behind why it's a good idea to eat this way. And when I think about fiber and wanting to have um, our protein and most of what we eat wrapped in fiber, I was looking at my chickpea salad, my, oh, my bad, my tuna salad. <laughs> I was looking at my tuna salad. <laughs> and so I had chickpeas in it. I had kale. I threw some grapes in there. Um, and then uh, I think, I, I know I didn't have onions because I'm not a fan of uh, chopping up raw onions, but I think I might have some powdered garlic or something like that. But we have more time, you know, during the lockdown and, uh, or stay at home or as it's starting to, to ease. I'm sure a lot of people revisited the kitchen and that's why I can't find yeast right? Because I want to bake bread. I can't find yeast anywhere. So we have like a lot of bakers in town, like a ton of bakers. But um, that's one thing. That's one thing to do, you know, how, how to eat more healthy, which really feeds back in, dovetails nicely to uh, reducing stress when you are eating and fueling yourself well. That's great. So not no particular fruit or vegetable deals with stress. It's pretty much a healthy diet, period, is what you're saying can help alleviate some stress that we may be experiencing. Okay. I would like to um, add, thank you, um, Dr. Weir, for, for bringing nutrition up. Um, mm -hmm. there, are, there are some foods um, that um, can supply tryptophan, which is an essential amino acid um, such as the flax seeds, pumpkin seeds, um, kidney beans, um, and the, they provide a precursor of the tryptophan for serotonin, which helps regulate mood, mood and rest. Um, so there are, you know, some foods that can, um, can help uh, with, you know, stress regulation. Okay. Give us some. What are they? <laughs> oh, yes. pumpkin, pumpkin seeds, the seeds. Um, oats, bean family. So that's just a few of them. Okay. Again, they supply the uh, tryptophan, the essential amino acid, acid, important for serotonin production. That's great. I've heard a lot of people talking about pumpkin seeds. I'm sorry, go ahead. And there are other things that increase serotonin, you know, also. Um, and, and those neurotransmitters in the brain, um, for example, um, the exercise that was previously talked about um, that helps release um, that um, the, the dopamine and even simply smiling, smiling and laughing, laughing more often can help release um, those those good feel of uh, neurotransmitters in the brain um, to um, help to alleviate stress. You know, we should all just give us we, we should give a pause for smiling. I know, now. just a smile. Like yes. <laughs> and, and you know they said even forced smile, forced smile can generate these neurotransmitters. Yeah, I like and that. And forced mm -hmm. Absolutely. I want to add to that nutrition. To the nutrition. Sure. Uh, some other foods like the the citrus fruit, fruits, oranges. Uh, they're rich in vitamin C, antioxidants that help um that help also in uh, stress relief. Brazil nuts. 
and um, some other things. Yeah, like she had mentioned flaxseed and um, dark chocolate. You know, chocolate with at least 75% of cocoa, very good. And chamomile tea is very relaxing. And some other, another thing you can also learn to do is to practice meditation. Some people are into yoga, or, but even if you can go through the yoga, you can actually just learn to practice meditation and learn to practice deep breathing. It's, it, these are things that some people say, oh, they can't meditate, they just get distracted. I say it comes with practice, and with practice, um, you, you, of course, you're perfect on the art, but it's a way to distress. Sometimes listening to music, soft music, um, also helps and is distressing. And getting enough sleep. As an adult, you're expected to get in at least seven to nine hours of sleep a day. And it's recommended that 90, at least 90 minutes before you go to bed, you should shut off all forms of um, blue, blue light, like the, the laptop, the phone, any form of rays, at least 90 minutes before you, you go to bed. And so it's important now. People just think, just you know, Netflix and Netflix and chilling all true. It's important that we um, keep the sleep time constant and the quality of sleep also helps us, so that you wake up and you feel. Some people, you wake up and you're feeling stressed out. You wake up and feel relaxed. If the quality of your sleep is optimal, so aside from getting the seven to nine hours, the quality of sleep is very important. I tell people, as soon as you wake up to use the loo, when you go back, don't pick up your phone to check who to drop the comments on your post. Just go back to bed, put the phone away. And that way, because the, the light is also is, is signaling a lot of stress, but you won't even understand how much stressing you out. It's true. It's true. Screen time, too. Screen time. You know, not just screen time for kids. Adults, we think we don't need screen time. But we need screen time even more than the kids because we're like always on social media doing one thing or the other. And you don't realize that it's giving you that constant headache. Like it's just there. It's like just very little stressing you out and you don't even realize. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't put your phone on silent or just shut down. Social media will still be back when you wake up. It's true. It's so true. It's not going anywhere. And you gave us a lot of great I strategies. Go ahead, Dr. Ware. I wanted to ask, um, you know, ask everyone when we, 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 we just spoke about two things that are polar opposites, but which can both have an effect on calming stress. And one is, um, smiling. And if we take smiling to the extreme, I'd say laughter. And if you think of its cousin, um, you know, uh, having an attitude of playfulness. I'm not sure if Dr. Chinasa mentioned that because I didn't quite hear it as uh, clearly towards the middle part, uh, towards the end. But let's say smiling, laughter, and play versus meditation. So they are different energy states completely, which both can work. So my question is, what do you use? What is, you know, or do, do you use one more than the other in trying to manage your stress or, uh, well, yes, as leaders to manage your stress or do you use both equally? That's a great question. I feel like it could vary. You gotta kind of explore it, right? To kind of see what works for you. What are you gonna say, Jamie? I, I, I was gonna say that as when it comes down to from a leadership perspective where stress is concerned before i'm going to start i'm going to take a bite at the first part of the question and then i'm going to leave um chinasa to take the rest of it but the first part of her stress in terms of leadership i think in a great degree has a lot to do with winning or losing um performance and those things and i think when we look at it from that perspective most times when you hear that leaders are going through great stress is because the task that they're completing is not they're not doing their best at it the team that they're working with is not producing as much. Hence, they may be at risk of losing their position. And the risk of losing your position means that you're in a position whereby you may not be able to take care of your family or your responsibilities. Now that sends you along a path whereby you may incur stress mm -hmm. on others who you're working with. Now the next step is what do you do from that point onwards? I think one thing that we have to look at also that we could recognize some of the antecedent factors and the triggers that we have. For example, for myself, I remember once when I worked as a behavioral specialist and I'll be going to a certain client, I understood exactly what that environment was like. And as soon as I got in that car heading to that given client, 
I felt the difference. I felt like I wish I could just turn the time, hands of time and have everything move whereby this client stop would just be 20 minutes. And then after going through the same thing week after week, months after month, I said to myself, what about fo focusing on what is coming afterward? And normally whenever I had that client, I'd go to play some soccer right after that client. So guess what? I started focusing on the fact that I'm going to have a bad experience now, but something good is about to happen. And that served as a factor that guided my, my thinking. So I'm in that session and they're wreaking havoc. And I'm just like, you could keep doing what you're doing. In another half an hour, I'll be over there having the time of my life. So you could do your stuff. I'll be doing mine. And I think by finding a wedge in the middle there, because at that point, I could not just quit that job. I couldn't quit that task because my livelihood depended on it. So immediately I found a wedge. I found something that dealt with that stress factor, all those triggers that I was having. And then there were other clients whereby I wish I had them every day because the environment was just so good. I looked forward to it. So I think as leaders, as we think about those things, there's some things that we could work on without getting professional help. But I'm thinking that professional help is also a piece that sometimes we have to seek. And then there are some activities that we must engage in as leaders that will guide us. And when I say leaders, when I use the word leaders, I'm not just talking about leading a company. I'm talking about a mother, a father, a coach, a farmer. Whatever you do, you're the leader for that given scope or influence that you have. And without having a solid, stable mind, it may negatively impact the level of productivity that you experience. Great. So you bring up therapy. Anyone else want to comment on maybe the, the need to have a, maybe see a therapist to kind of unload some of what's on your mind? What do you guys think about seeing a therapist? Well, I think um, seeing a therapist may be I, I would say that um, when you don't, um, when you can't do it yourself, always ask for help. There's no no shame in asking for help, especially when you've been exposed to, a chron to chronic stress. So it's important that if you need to seek a therapy. If you, you, when you realize that oh, I've tried all these techniques on my own and it's not working, then seek external help. Sometimes, um, it, so it doesn't make, I always try to say asking for help doesn't make you less a person. But um, going back to what Dr. Yvette was asking about both um, techniques, I think it depends on the situation for me. It depends on where I am. If I see this piece, the, the, the space I'm in is like, oh, don't just play here. And I'm like, okay the deep breathing comes into play. That's what I just, I just breathe deeply while I'm, you know, I can't just be laughing hysterically, but some places, you know, it depends on, the, I see this, this place, these people, these people look like, I don't need a little bit of laughter here, and oh man, I just go. So you, you look at the space where you are, the situation, and find what works for you instantaneously. Smiling, laughter, those are very instantaneous distressors. They just work magic in the minute. And even the deep breathing, if I, you know, like you're in an exam situation where you're about to speak on a stage or you're, you're about to have a Zoom conference and you, you need to speak, you just, people can see you just laughing, ha, ha you're just coming and saying like, hey, what's, what's going on with her? You know, so it, you just it's breathing or you just very short one minute meditation and your, you feel the tension leave your shoulders. And so I think depending on what the importance is, know all these techniques. And at every point in your life, each one may need to come into play. And when it comes into play, please apply it. And whatever need you need to do at each time. And if you need to seek help, please don't, don't feel to call especially somewhere like here in Africa, we're very, we're not exactly very um we can go see specialists for <laughs> for stress. I think that's our mentality. Yeah, we're not very open to that kind of thing. We may be, the first person on your mind will be, okay, I should call my pastor or I should call my mommy in church. But those people are not exactly trained mm. to handle what we're still in that space where we're coming out to understand, okay, I need to seek professional help. I maybe need to say therapies. I need to say psychology, something. You know, we're still getting out of that space. And, you know, people don't want to be associated with they'll think oh you're going to say a therapist is like you have some sort of mental disorder that's the way we look at it here and it's not you know we, we have my people we have to understand that hey it's not that bad it's not it's whatever just you're thinking about yourself because the stress is going to affect you negatively and it's you it's not any other person so you have to fight for you if you need help for you please seek help great amen thanks for giving everyone permission 
Dr. Ware, you were going to say something. Yeah, I like um, I like the balance between both answers because I think what Jamie said is he's using his mind, and the mind is powerful. So um, I have done something kind of similar to where I have said this too will pass. <laughs> yeah, just kind of use that statement, mm -hmm. or this is not going to last forever. Um, you know, labor will end. And, you know, this situation will end, et cetera, et cetera, you know. And so I think that's, that's what he explained. And then I liked what Dr. Chinasa said where, you know, you kind of decide. We have our basic way that we're hardwired. Some people a little bit more extrovert than others. But within the context of what we're dealing with, um, what, makes, what makes better sense right now as far as helping uh, alleviate the situation because I think as leaders um, it's important that we that we set the tone you know it's just like uh, you have a child and the child falls down the first couple of times when they're learning how to walk and they look to you like what are you going to do what are you going to say and depending on our response to the child is how I think they respond. So it's almost as if, uh, you know, we're training them, they're training us. So as leaders, it's important to have within our toolbox, different ways that we can manage our own stress so that the people that we are leading can take their cues from us. At the end of the day, we want to stay as healthy as possible and we want to stay leading, so. If, if I could add something to that, um, Latasha, just to piggyback sure. on what Dr. Weir just made, made, made mention of, is that um, as leaders, we have to create a safe space for those who work with us or for us to share with us when they're not having their best experiences. Um, sometimes the fear of losing our position or losing um, the accolades or the admiration and sometimes a negative stigma that is attached to uh, being stressed or being depressed or going through a tough time we fail in our working environments to create that safe space for those who we work with or those who um, offer services to share that they're having a bad day or a bad moment or a bad week. And because they fail to do that, then we are not in a position to offer them the support or the recommendation that is needed to assist them. And sometimes all it takes is for little tweaks as a leader in terms of how we, we um, deal with our team. Because sometimes the stress that some of our team members are feeling is as a direct result of how we operate. So sometimes while we are not the ones stressed as leaders, we have to recognize how we are creating stress in the lives of others. Even as a parent, you know, we may be doing things in a home that is creating a stressful environment for our husband or our wives or our children just by what we're doing. So there are times when we have to assess what we're doing and look at the impact that is creating. As you talked about laughter and, and smiling, you know that when you say certain things to your kids, you see a smile. You know that when you, you ask your employee to do a, perform a particular task, you see how they look, how they respond. How do you affirm them? These things play a major role in the mindset of our team. And when I say team, I mean whoever we work with, work for, or whoever we live with, or whoever we serve. So when we think about our teams and when we think about those we are working with, we have to also understand that sometimes we may be the cause, not the cause, but we may be the, the persons who, who trigger the greatest stress that they're feeling and nobody benefits from that when that kind of environment is created. That's a good point. That's so true. Now, let me ask you guys something. I, uh, I know of some strategies that say I use personally, and sometimes I don't even know if it's just me saying it's helping. Um, what about massages? Um, do you think massages are a good form of kind of relieving some stress? I know I love them. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 massages are very good, especially like uh, the you know even if it's just a self of massage, just because this is where the tension. These are like tension spots, or and even under the feet. There are some strategic parts. You know the masseurs they know the strategic parts where tension tends to build up under your feet, right here on your back, lower back. So massaging these places, it will by yourself. You realize that you are 
feeling less as in you're distressing. Mm -hmm. So yes, massaging is very good. If you can get a full body massage intermittently, but well, maybe not in the pandemic, but mm -hmm. oh well. <laughs> <laughs> if you can, yeah, it's, it's a good for my I I am all for it. Okay. I, I, I also think um Latasha pausing, just just taking a break. Um, Dr. Weir said about the environment. When you spoke earlier, Dr. Weir, you made mention sometimes you just need to pause. You just need to stop what you're doing because, as you said, sometimes you don't know how stressed you are until you have gotten a chance. I remember I was taking a subway once and that long ride gave me a chance to like, wow, you're carrying a lot of weight on your shoulders. You need to take a break. So sometimes just the power of a pause, just rest for a moment and allow your body, your mind to heal itself. And that in itself helps to relieve the level of tension that you're feeling and make you better fit for what you're doing. That's true. I, I would just add to the, the power of a pause because you know that as a speaker, if we're speaking, sometimes we are uh, people. We do, well, it's Dr. Weir, she'll be popping back in soon. Dr. Moore, you wanted to say something? Yes, um, as, as leaders and even if we're not leaders, we need to recognize that it's okay to cry. Cry mm. helps relieve stress. And and how does the, the, the group feel? Um, does if if you see a um, one of the, your your team members, uh, if they see you cry, do you think that has a negative impact on your leadership? Um, how they perceive your leadership skills? Mm, that's a good one. Is it okay to cry in front of the team, whether it's at home? I'm, or I'm, 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna take a stab. I'm gonna take a stab at it. Ladies, if I'm wrong, don't be don't be offended. You you could you could take you could clap back at me. I'm okay with that. Clap back at me. I'm just being honest. Well, for me, um, serving in a leadership position, while it's okay to cry, I create for myself an inner circle that gives me the latitude to share where I'm at. Reason being, my immediate environment and those who I supervise, based on cultural differences, they may not exactly recognize that they need to empathize when I'm going through a tough time. That may be a, a supporting factor for them to no longer invest trust and confidence in my leadership, while that should not be the case. So what I do, I have for myself a secure group, a group that I have openness to share what I'm going through, challenges, obstacles, and even opportunities. So I get a chance to give the open, free feedback and receive it so that I could use that environment to really take a look at what I'm going through and sometimes reposition myself um, in terms of my thinking pattern. So for me, I'm not one to cry in, in front of my groups or or big tears and, and nah, I'm not, I, but there are times when they could notice that he's not having the best day and they'll be like, Jamie, what's happening? I'm like, you, it's one of those days where you have to take the difficult easy. And I just keep on pushing through. But I have my folks who I may put a phone call in, hey, how are you doing? I'm going to, could we talk about this or, or something like that? And that normally helps. But for me, there are times when people in my team, they're at that point and I offer them the support and I give them a private place also for them to, to express themselves because sometimes by them doing that publicly may also negatively impact their image. And while that should not be the case, but in most cases, people tend to sometimes invest less trust in your capacity to do things because you come across as just being a human being. And I want to throw this out to the other uh, individuals on the panel who happen to be female because, um, <laughs> you know, sometimes that impacts, you know, when people see women, they tend to think that we're more emotional. So when we cry in situations, mm -hmm. sometimes it's expected and sometimes it's used to 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 say why women don't necessarily belong in leadership roles. Sometimes we're we're tagged that way. So what do you ladies think about about being vulnerable and crying in front of your team? No, I I, I won't cry in front of my well, team. Well, no uh, way. I won't. <laughs> you say you won't do it. Doctor. <laughs> no way. Did oh, did Doctor Chinasa no, say she she would not? Yeah, she said she would not. Yeah. No, I won't. I'll do it in the back. You know, I like I have I have my sounding boards. I call them my sounding boards. So I call them and I can ball if I need to ball. You know, but it will be shit if I'm balling. I'm like, are you sure? Just this? Or just something else? Yeah, it's like, hey, why are you like something else happened? You know, they can't really place it because 
I'm not exactly a crier, but <laughs> I can cry, but not in front of the team. No way. I'll just pretend like maybe I was cutting onions or something and it just got into my eye, but I can't even cry. No way. No way. <laughs> All right. Dr. Where would you say? I, I think it, it, it depends on the leadership that you've established to begin mm. with. So it's very difficult to go into a situation and you're, you know, weeping, weeping, um, a weeping willow. I'm trying to find a name that starts with W, but <laughs> <laughs> weeping, we weeping, weir. Um, mm. but I have, I, I like to say emote. I have emoted with my team. Um, the only reason that I did so, though, was because I felt like I was safe. So you have to be in a situation where you can be vulnerable. And that takes emotional investment. If you have invested in your team such that they are, they are um, a team extraordinaire and they've got your back the same way you have theirs, then, then that's possible. We are only human. Something, something might touch us very deeply, but it all depends on your leadership. And, and when I am with a team, I invest in them emotionally. So it, rare, it rarely happens, but it wouldn't be the worst thing. It would not be the worst. That's fair. That's fair. I, think, I think it comes down to relationship. Mm. Um, because the reason why I can share what I'm feeling with my immediate group or my inner circle is because of the relationship that we share. And sometimes I think why leaders are fearful of crying in front of their team or breaking down is because of the level of trust and understanding exactly how they'll be judged. And, and nobody is really willing to give up their, their position or their sphere of influence because of anything. So, but as Dr. Weir made mention is that it depends on how much you invest in your team and there are certain things that it's okay to do. For example, I remember once when a staff member, a member for a team was going through a hard time, I think they had lost a loved one or something like that. And I was at that table talking and I, I saw what was happening and, and it brought tears to my eyes. Now, for me, with that kind of tear for me, I felt comfortable doing that because all of us were relating to what was happening. At other times, maybe I would have walked out to, to, to take some fresh air or something. But at that point, I felt comfortable and safe in terms of being that emotional in that setting because i recognize that it was not only impacting me positively but my co work my, my my teammate who was going through a hard time um it was they were able she was able to recognize that this person feels my pain and i was just i was just like they're not saying much but the tears were just coming down because what they were going through was such a serious and hard time so i felt i felt the overwhelming support to not just feel like crying and running to the bathroom but i felt like it's okay to let her see that guess what what is happening here is painful not only to you but as your leader i'm feeling it and then we're finished and, and move on in that case so so i think there are appropriate times but the, there are times people are wired differently and i had another leader who she cried a heartbeat or he'll cry a heartbeat you tell him that he just tears he just kept on coming and that's a, so that person them crying or not crying meant nothing to anybody because even if even if you're celebrating a birthday, it brought tears. You know what I'm saying so. So they'll cry at a heartbeat. The soccer game and, and we won, they started crying. So you just know another crying person. So that's different. So I think sometimes how you're wired dictate how you're viewed by, by others yeah. and how they take it too, you know. All right. I like that. And and that and that, and well, that may Jamie, be me. Jamie, I, let Jamie, Jamie, might I ask, did you feel less of him because he could cry in a heartbeat? I mean, was he still an effective leader, mm. um, even though he was more emotional than your gender normally is? Well, you know what? I think I, I, I don't know, guys. Is that a fear question? Dr. Weir is asking me, guys. Could somebody help me? <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to be honest. The, the, the person who was crying was somebody who was considered to be, in a general sense, that person came across as a much more hardcore person than everybody else. Mm. It's just that they, that person wore his emotions on his sleeve. So it wasn't somebody who you'd consider less of a, a male for crying, but it was just the way that person was, whereby once they're overjoyed or, or they're sad or they feel really passionate about something, 
um, the first expression that comes, the first thing that you see, tears running down. So I did not view that person any less because they were some they, they cried easily. Okay, thank you for that. Now I wanted to ask you guys a question. Is it possible to lead a stress-free life? Is it possible to be a stress-free leader? <laughs> I don't think it's possible. I think I think I think Dr. Chinasa should answer that because when I watch her videos, she takes off all my stress. <laughs> <Going back. laughs> no, I don't think it's possible to leave stress in a normal it's a normal reaction. It's a normal life reaction. But we, we're talking about it being bad when it's now distress, like something we call good stress, you stress and bad stress, distress. So when it's now bad stress, that's when it's a problem that's when it's pathological you need the stress the stress is like you know in those days when the hunter goes famine and a lion comes they call it the fight or flight response that is the stress mechanism so you need it to function you need it to be able to react you need it to even be sometimes you need it you need that um whole adrenaline uh, moment to be able to speak well yeah, so it's you no, know, there's no way to live a, a really stress free life, but there's a way to, you can manage bad stress. So that it's important to manage bad stress adequate as much as you can, because like in this time of the, of the pandemic, there's a lot of things that's causing chronic stress, job loss, medical trauma, medical situation, financial situation, different traumas, even the thought of COVID-19 is stressful. But this is the time, like uh, I think Dr. Wei said earlier, about you have to be creative. You have to invest your energy somewhere else. Fine, oh, you've lost your job now. That's enough stress. So, but it will be worse when you add some uh, chronic stress and then you come down with either high blood pressure or diabetes or some other comorbidity, you do not need that right now. So you have to be intentional with managing stress in this already existing stressful period. So there's really nothing much anybody can do about the pandemic. It's global. So you say that it's global, so it's important you learn to manage the situation. We are in a stressful situation, but you have to learn how those cannot control the situation, but you can control how you react in this situation. So now this is where we need, what we need to do as leaders, as individuals, as members of families, we have to try our best to prevent that bad stress from, because we now know that bad stress can affect our health and you do not want to have a comorbidity in this COVID-19 era. So it's important to you intentional. That's the word. You have to be intentional with managing your mind, managing what you see, managing what you say, and managing how you live. Good stuff. You all agree? I agree. I agree. Um, now, as far as the, the good stress, um, also known as you stress that Dr. Chinasa was talking about, that can help provide momentum to complete a task that you may have, you know, procrastinated, you know, in the past. So um, it, if there was no stress, we would not be alive because even when we think about even just the, the process of, of giving birth, that's, that's a very stressful situation. So it's stress is necessary for life, um, but again, how we manage it is the important, important piece, how we respond to it. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, before we did someone, I would oh, go ahead, Dr. Weir. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say I agree with both docs in that um, it is, I, I believe, physiologically not possible to to exist without stress. That it's it's um, it's what really keeps us going. But I'm not going to go into <laughs> I'm not going to go into the biology or the the medical side of how. The you know as Dr. Lynette said, the absence of stress, you're just you're just not even alive. You know, um, I, I like what was mentioned earlier with I think it was Jamie who said the pause, and then you know serendipitously I just went on a pause. Like I I swear I didn't plan that, <laughs> but I I just paused out because um, some of us practice a weekly pause and it regulates what we do. I, I, I cannot, I cannot 
imagine people that work seven days a week that don't have an intentional pause or rest or, you know, otherwise known as rest, otherwise known for, for some of us as a Sabbath rest into the cycle of what we do. Because I think for myself, that's a huge, huge factor in um, how I manage stress. And every seven days, I know that I'm just going to put everything aside that was work related and secular. And I'm just going to be in nature, in fellowship, um, more intentional, doing things that are of a spiritual nature. I also think, and it was mentioned before, that um, our stress is, if, if, it, if it's long term and if it's prolonged or chronic, it's deleterious to our health and definitely um, releases cortisol, which is not the kind of you know, chemical that you want in your body long term. But if it's short term, then it's preparing us for a situation. It's preparing us for at its, at its um, most elementary stage, fight or flight. And I think in that aspect, we are wonderfully and fearfully made so whether or not we are running from, you know, running from an animal, uh, getting ready to fight, or even getting ready to speak. So, you know, I know Jamie would, would agree with me with this, you know, just before we get on to speak and anyone else, you know, of you, everyone probably are speakers, any of you are speakers, just before you get on, are you totally relaxed? Like, I'm not. I mean, I am, but I am not. You know, there's, there's just a little bit of tension. There's a little bit of stress. And that little bit of stress helps me not to be so relaxed, um, but to, I, I harness that. And then um, once I start speaking and I get the feedback and I, and I and, um, you know, I get a sense of the audience, then I can kind of relax. So that stress does not even really last the entire presentation. It's the first five minutes before, 10 minutes before, 15 minutes before, five minutes into. So stress can be good. You know, um, we make it our friend if we realize uh, this is just, this is short term. This is not, you know, somebody coming. We, we don't want stress to be like a, uh, an, uh, a visitor that stays too long. We want stress like to be that. just a, a, a small event that occurs to help prepare us. And that is just how we are wonderfully and fearfully designed to manage that. I love that. That's excellent. Great. Now, before we go, I mean, we we have talked, you guys have shared a lot of different strategies for managing stress. I mean, we, we learned that one, stress is just going to be a part of life. There's good stress and there's bad stress. We've learned that the key is finding strategies to manage it. Um, and you guys have given us so many wonderful ways to do that. Um, and so I want to hear from each of you, what is your personal way of managing your stress? What's the, just give me one, your favorite way to manage your stress. Jamie, let's start with you. Let's unmute mute yourself. Okay, my, my favorite way of managing stress is through exercise. All right, good. Dr. Moore? Exercise is my my favorite way also to relieve stress. Okay, interesting. Dr. Chinasa? I don't have one. Okay, let me just one. Oh, but I don't have one. Exercise and cooking. I have to say two. Or one, two. I like exercising and cooking. They go hand in hand. <laughs> All right. Dr. Weir? Oh, I think we lost her. <laughs> maybe she's taking another pause and that's maybe, maybe she's pausing. <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, just want to thank the panel again. This has been a very healthy discussion about stress. And I hope those who are watching were paying attention and taking notes on ways that they can manage their stress. Um, I was trying to see if I can get Dr. Weir. But uh, we hope that you enjoyed the dialogue. Um, if you have any questions for this team, you know where to reach them. Um, but we just want to thank you guys again for another healthy discussion. Um, thank you so much. We appreciate this dialogue. Thank you.
All right, and we're signing off. And remember, it's okay to experience stress. It's all about how you manage it. All right, we'll see you all next time.